Hello, my name is Joshua Gilliland and thank you for joining me for my 2014 eDiscovery Case Law Year in Review. We had a wonderful year in eDiscovery. Lots of practical cases dealing with proportionality, predictive coding, the foreign production, and taxation of costs. We will explore each with selected cases in the following material. eDiscovery in 2014 is sponsored by Paragon. Paragon is committed to making their clients more successful, not just in document review, but in their business as a whole. Paragon provides end-to-end e-discovery services and is also helping their clients mitigate emerging challenges arising from cyber threats and the information privacy concerns. Paragon understands the challenges faced by their clients because so many of their people used to be clients. Paragon, service, experience, advantage. We have many lessons from 2014. We will examine proportionality, predictive coding, foreign production, and taxation of cost cases from this past year. Proportionality was very much alive and well in 2014. Proportionality can be described as the balancing of interests. What is the cost of the discovery versus the information's value to the case? Now, this past year, I, I had this tweet come from a service provider, and they stated, proportionality is irrelevant because cost effectiveness is the new hotness. Cost effectiveness is outstanding. That does not make proportionality irrelevant. It might make undue burden because electronically stored information is not reasonably accessible irrelevant, but that's not what proportionality is about. Proportionality is the balancing of the cost of the discovery against how the information is useful to the case. And those who tweeted out proportionality is irrelevant just had a huge misconception on what proportionality actually is. Let's look at the rule. Federal Rule of Civil Procedure Rule 26B2C states a court can limit discovery if the burden or the expense of the proposed discovery outweighs its likely benefit. It's balancing analysis. Just because e-discovery might cost a certain amount, be it cheaper now because of the technology we have, it still has to be balanced against the value of the information to the case. Is it useful? Is it helpful? Is it relevant? Because if it is not relevant and if it's not useful, any cost, no matter how low, is too much to charge a client. Therefore, such discovery should not be permitted. Well, let's talk about the cases where proportionality was applied. And here are just a couple. So we have form production for a database exported as PDF. It was a unique database and its export feature was as PDFs. And in that situation, proportionality cited with the production as a PDF. Another case was prohibiting production of third party information in a discrimination case. And that was out of the great state of Nebraska. And prohibiting the expansion of the scope of discovery by nine months. And we're going to jump into this one with, with a lot of detail because this is a fun case. Because one party claimed the fact that predictive coding could be used by the producing party effectively would nullify the proportionality argument. Let's break down what, what happened here. The defendants claimed that expanding the scope of discovery by nine months would increase their review cost by 26% or $390,000 based upon past experience. The plaintiffs countered that the review cost would more likely be $11,279 because of the predictive coding system that the defendants would use instead of manual review. So right out of the gate, we can see this fight is getting specific because when you can say we think review costs will only be $11,279, that's a very specific number. Or saying that review would only be uh, you know, 26 percent would, would increase their cost by 26 percent. Again, very specific. So that meant the underlying affidavits attached to the pleadings had lots of information for the court to examine. This boils down to the requesting party telling the reviewing party how to review 
and the requesting party basically telling the producing party, you don't have a burden. Pretty unique. So the defendants countered in this case that predictive coding did not make manual review for relevance elective because the predictive coding software assigned a percentage estimate to each record of the record's probability of being relevant. Therefore, attorney review was still required for relevance and privilege review. You still had to look at it. Based upon everything that was before the court, uh, the court denied expanding the scope of discovery by nine months based upon uh, the proportionality rules. The information did not justify expanding the scope because the court didn't think it was necessarily useful compared to the cost that the party would incur. Moreover, it's very interesting to see one party claim predictive coding negated the proportionality argument. Just not true. Well, let's segue into predictive coding cases and what we saw in 2014. And one theme that I'll point out is, it's a, it's a personal thought, stop asking permission from the judge and from the opposing party if you can use predictive coding. It's kind of like asking, can I use Word or do you want me to use Word Perfect when I write my brief? You shouldn't have to ask for that. In this one case where predictive coding came up, uh, there was a lot of discovery that needed to be reviewed. Uh, they estimated it would be very expensive to do so. And they thus sought relief from the court saying, can we use predictive coding? And dealing with backup tapes and, and a lot of information. And the court suddenly opined when, why are you asking us this? And I'll read the quote here from Judge uh, Ronald Bush. Uh, and although it is a proper role of the court to supervise the discovery process and intervene when it is abused by the parties, the court is not normally in the business of dictating to parties the process that they should use when responding to discovery. If our focus were on paper discovery, we would not, for example, be dictating a party the manner in which it should review documents for responsiveness or privilege, such as whether that review should be done by a paralegal, a junior attorney, or a senior attorney. Which then still brings up the why ask, as the quote goes on, yet it, that is in essence what the parties are asking the court to consider, whether document review should be done by humans or with the assistance of computers. Respondent fears an incomplete response to his discovery. If respondent believes that the ultimate discovery response is incomplete and can support that belief, he can file another motion to compel at that time. Nevertheless, because we have not previously addressed the issue of computer-assisted review tools, we will address it here. In my view, that is the test. Is the production adequate? When you start fighting over whether or not someone can review, use review technology, be it computer-assisted review of any kind from predictive coding to exemplars to clustering to visual analytics, that's not the test. Is the production adequate? Do you have gaps? Is there something that makes you not trust the production? Because when you go to court asking the judge to say, can we use this technology? I think you're asking for an advisory opinion and I think it's improper, but that's my point of view. We also had case management orders come up and perhaps some lawyers got tired of having this fight. So in a they're after a meet and confer and their rule 20, excuse me, their, you know, rule 26 F hearing, uh, and their reform filled out for their 16 B conference that they agreed in their order that the judge signed off on in lieu of identifying responsive ESI using search terms and custodians, a party may use a technology assisted review platform to identify potentially relevant documents in ESI. I don't think that's necessary because I don't think it's required by the rules. But if you are concerned the other side's going to be fighting you tooth and nail, getting a sign off like this that's going to be 
codified as a court order for your case management order, not necessarily a bad idea if you want to put that issue to rest. However, this one's broad enough that you, no one's getting boxed in to any particular type of search technology. The other issue that's come up is parties asking the opposing party permission to use predictive coding technology. And I question that strategy. I don't think you need to do it. I think you need to be able to certify your searches. I need to be able to certify that everything you did uh, shows that everything was defensible. But I don't think the other side gets veto power over what you do. And in this case, the defendant suggested using predictive coding for document review. The plaintiff disagreed with using predictive coding and that the defendant's estimate that reviewing attorneys would only review 250 files a day. So that's why they thought, hey, this would be a good idea. We think a reviewing attorney will only get through 250 documents a day. We're going to need 50 of them. That's going to cost lots of money. Let's use predictive coding. This effectively turned into a fight over how quickly can lawyers read? And further adding to the strangeness of this opinion, the court was not asked, can we use predictive coding? The relief sought was order us to meet and confer about using predictive coding. Now to give you a reason why predictive coding would have been a good idea in this case uh, was the scale of the litigation. It involved uh, an oil pipeline, so there's lots of litigation that went back many years. So you had, in, in this case, had 16 separate lawsuits with 165 discovery requests just in one case, a total of 392 requests for all the related cases together, and 83 custodians with approximately 2.7 million electronic documents. The paper discovery that they had totaled 63,000 pages, give or take, and went back to 1988, so back to the Reagan administration. They had reviewed somewhere between 600 to 800,000 documents for responsiveness, confidentiality, and privilege, and they had produced over 53,000 documents uh, consisting of over 190,000 pages. So using technology-assisted review was, was a good call in this case. I'm just not sure they needed to ask permission of the other side to do so. A big lesson this year was from the progressive case. And effectively, don't sign off on an e-discovery order for a protocol that limits your ability to use different technology. So in this case, we, we had a data set that was narrowed by search terms to over 565,000 hits from a data set of 1.8 million. Search term methodology had been agreed to in a ESI protocol by the parties. And after a month into the document review, the producing party realized it could take six to eight months to review everything. So on their own and going against the ESI protocol, they unilaterally decided to use predictive coding instead. Uh, moreover, after telling the other side about their change in uh, technology, motion practice quickly followed. The requesting party wanted the producing party, the, the folks who wanted to use predictive coding, to either produce uh, the over 565,000 cold documents uh, from the 1.8 million data set that was used uh, upon the parties agreed upon methodology, or the producing party would apply the predictive coding methodology to the entire 1.8 million records in the data set. The court did something that was not prescribed within the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure, in my opinion. The court looked to the De Silva Moore opinion, which, if I remember right, is like a 45 page opinion, give or take, there's a lot of information in there. And there's a lot of balancing and analysis that Judge Andrew Peck had in there about the use of predictive coding in that case. Highlighting the danger of that entire opinion, people tend to focus on this one quote about the use of predictive coding. 
full disclosure about the technology used, the process, and the methodology, including the documents used to train the computer, is required for the producing party to provide to the requesting party. I don't think that's required in the code at all. I think that is completely judge-made law, and I think that's because people focus on that one element of De Silva Moore, which I don't think it was Judge Peck's intent to create this weird system in which you have to put all your cards on the table in order to use predictive coding. The test is whether or not the production is adequate. And when we start deviating from that, I think we get bigger problems. So the ultimate court order issued in this case was the court ordered the producing party to follow the original agreed upon ESI protocol and to produce all of the 565,000 documents to the requesting party within 14 days. When you think back to the case management order that said it's okay to use technology assisted review, I cannot help but wonder if that was one party's attempt to be progressive after the progressive opinion. Well, let's talk about foreign production because you think eight years after the federal rules of civil procedure were amended in 2006 originally, we would have this down. But there's still a lot of cases dealing with Rule 34 and the foreign production. This case is from the Northern District of California, and it's a Judge Graywall opinion. And Judge Paul Graywall is one of the new heroes in e-discovery, Silicon Valley, very smart. I got to see him several hours after he got sworn in on the bench several years ago, and I had high hopes at that point in time he would give a lot of great e-discovery insight, and he has. In this case, we have this wonderful opening quote. Most lawyers, and hopefully judges, would be forgiven if they could not recite on demand some of the more obscure of the federal rules of civil procedure. Rule 80 uh, for stenographic transcript as evidence, and Rule 64, seizing of a person or property, come to mind. But Rule 34, producing documents, electronically stored information, and tangible thing, is about as basic as any civil case as it gets. And yet, over and over again, the undersigned is confronted with misapprehension of its standards and elements by even experienced counsel. Unfortunately, this case presents yet another example. So what happened here? Well, the court does a wonderful job of breaking down Rule 34B. 2E. And for if you're a civil procedure geek like me, this is fantastic because this is what the rules say uh, between section I and II. A party must produce documents as they are kept in the ordinary course of business or must organize and label them to correspond to the categories in the request. If a request does not specify a form for producing electronically stored information, a party must produce it in a form or forms in which it is ordinarily maintained or in a reasonably usable form or forms. A party need not produce the same electronically stored information in more than one form. So what happened in this case? The defendant served discovery requests on the plaintiffs and wanted the discovery and the organized information labeled to identify the request to which they were responsive. The plaintiff did not want to do that and instead produced over 41,000 pages of discovery, which ended with the court ordering reproduction for the following under either part of Rule 34B2E. So let's break this down exactly to understand the rules. The court noted that even if there was an agreement on the form production under Rule 34B2E, EII that would not absolve a producing party of its obligation to produce ESI as is kept in the ordinary course of business under Rule 34B2EI. Now, Judge Graywall explained that the language of Federal Rule Civil Procedure Rule 34B2EI is clear. If documents are not organized and labeled to correspond to the categories in the request, they must be produced as they are kept in the ordinary course of business.
let's talk about the distinction between the two. Because when you look at what has to happen, let's break down this quote from the judge. This distinction matters. From under subsection II is about whether the production should be native, near native, imaged as PDF, or more commonly as TIFFs accompanied by load files containing searchable text and metadata, or in paper. Providing information about how documents in ESI are kept under subsection I at a minimum mean that the disclosing party should provide information about each document, which ideally would include in some fashion, the identity of the custodian or person from whom the documents were obtained, an indication of whether they are retained in hard copy or digital format, assurance that the documents have been produced in the order in which they are maintained, and a general description of the filing system from which they were recovered. In this case, there was no agreement on the form of production. Thus, the pro plaintiff producing party had a duty under Rule 34B2EII to show that the production was either as the ESI was orally, ordinarily maintained or in a reasonably usable form. And that didn't happen. Well, let's talk about something completely different. And this gets into what I call e-discovery alchemy. It's a funky little case. And while it might technically be correct, I, I don't think it is. So what happened here? Well, we had we have the following questions coming up. Does scanning paper documents to PDFs make the discovery electronically stored information? So can you turn paper into electronically stored information? And if scanned paper discovery is ESI under the rules, does a producing party have to organize the production under rule 34B2EI? And in this case, this is where things get a little, well, it's paper transcendence. Paper becomes electronically stored information. And the court found that the party's agreement to produce paper as PDFs transmuted, like an alchemist, paper into electronically stored information. The impact this had on the case. As such, the organization requirement under Rule 34B2EI did not apply to the former paper production. Rule 34B2EII controlled instead, which requires CSI productions to be in the form it is ordinarily maintained or in a reasonably usable form. I don't think this is right. The fact that you agree to produce paper as PDFs or as TIFFs with OCR does not mean it turns into electronically stored information in the literal sense, so it falls under a different category under the rules. I think that's just weird. I don't think that's the intent of this, and I don't think it's meant to take it out of the organization requirement. I do not think the organization requirement is limited to simply paper productions because there are cases where the organization requirement has been applied to electronically stored information. So I think this case is an anomaly. I think it's very weird. And, and there were other odd parts in this where the court even discussed uh, whether the use of reviewing electronically stored information in a review platform pr for privilege eliminated the ability to produce the ESI in, its, in the usual course of business because it had been in a review platform. I, I don't think that's right. I mean, that's not the industry standard. You need to be able to review electronically stored information in a way where the metadata is not changed and having it in a review platform is one of those ways to do it. So people are conducting, say, near native review. They can then download or open the native file if they need to. Uh, but this is just, just an odd little opinion. Uh, I think it's an outlier. I don't think it's correct, but it's definitely worth talking about because it happened this year. Which brings us to taxation of costs. 
there are many great taxation of cost issues that come up with electronic discovery. We had a great one that had a lot of lessons to it from the Northern District of California. In this case, the prevailing party sought $61,000 and change in costs. They got just over 7,000. And the big lesson here is document your costs. You have to invoice in a way that a court can look at your invoice when it's attached to an attorney affidavit when you're going after taxation of costs so the court can understand why it was necessary for the case. That didn't happen here. The court actually stated that the information in the invoices was insufficient to, term, to determine whether the costs were taxable. And these costs included the document processing invoices, uh, including fees for con conversion from native file to TIFF, bait stamping, which is again not done by a person with a stamp, but it's part of the processing engine now, and going through metadata, project management fees, and a whole bunch of other things. In addition to cost for conversion to static images in that part of processing. Now, the project management costs were also interesting because this is normally where someone is interacting with an attorney. They perhaps are responding to discovery requests, search queries are being conducted. They're figuring out how to navigate the data here. Well, all that was denied because it was unclear from the invoices whether the project management fees were actually related to document processing as opposed to other non-taxable activities. Here are some screenshots from the actual invoices. And there are many, so this, this is just two of them. But one of them says e-discovery, e-discovery hyphen processing of raw data per TIFF, the, the number done, the cost, and that it, that particular job was over $5,000. Then project management and client requests, it just says project management per hour, number of hours, the billable rate, and that was over $1,400 for the cost. That's not enough information for a court to look at. Here's the challenge. Most service providers don't bill like an attorney. Lawyers are used to when documenting their time to say, I prepared the following discovery requests, I reviewed this range of documents, I analyzed these privileges, they get specific. So that way the clients understand what work was done as opposed to simply putting document review. The other factor here is these invoices probably reflect the industry standard. I honestly believe that most service providers bill this way. There are probably some who, who give more detail, but I think this is the norm for a lot of folks. And the reason is the service providers don't know any better unless they have lawyers on staff to help them understand this, or unless their clients, the attorneys, are helping them understand these issues and to bill more effectively. Because when you see something that says project management and client requests, define them. Say, call with X attorney regarding discovery requests. One, two, three, four, list them out. State what searches were performed and explain what was done as opposed to simply project management. Now, a possible solution to this is to document to explain how services were necessary for the litigation, uh, how they were required for the production and not just intellectual efforts. Moreover, that cannot be a self-fulfilling statement of these services were necessary. You can't actually just state that. You have to explain why. How does A plus B equals C? And I think that's what service providers need to be doing. They have to contain enough specific date, uh, details, such as a uh, search request connected to discovery requests, that would explain to a court why the work that was done by the service provider was necessary for the litigation, was required for the production, and was not just the equivalent of being in a giant digital warehouse. I again want to thank Paragon for sponsoring this year in review. I look forward to analyzing the issues in 2015. 
and I hope all of you have a very, very happy new year. One final note on 2014. Like many others, I was deeply saddened by the passing of Browning Marine this past summer. Browning was a wonderful human being, an outstanding attorney, and truly the first statesman of e-discovery. You'll be truly missed, and Browning, thank you for everything.